Okay, welcome everybody to one more of the three seminars. Today we have Nicholas Grant with us. He received his uh, undergraduate degree from the University of Adelaide and then he followed through with a PhD uh, that he got from uh, uh, the Australian National University. He is currently an ASI uh, postdoc fellow and he's working at the Center for Sustainable Energy uh, Systems. And his area of interest is mostly developing low cost effective, uh, high efficiency solar cells. And his talk today is going to be on the low temperature anodically grown silicon dioxide films for solar cell applications. Uh, please welcome uh, Nick to uh, this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Ivan. Um, so, yeah, as Ivan was saying, um, today's talk is going to be about um, anodic oxide films for solar cell applications. Um, so, the outline of the presentation will um, firstly look at the electrochemical cell design and the properties that I've been using over the last couple of years. Um, but then we'll talk about a direct current anodization procedure. Um, this will be split into two parts. The first part will be looking at um, the oxide growth mechanisms and you know its properties. And then the second part we look at the uh, surface passivation achieved by the um, DC anodic oxidation procedure. Um, and then we'll look at uh, an alternating current anodic oxidations um, to, to um, examine whether the surface recombination achieved by this method is better than the, um, the DC method. And then we'll look at the Im impact of the nitric acid purity level on the surface preservation and then the degradation and then finally we'll finish up with some um, uh, anodic oxides for masking purposes. Okay, so what are anodic oxidations? So it's basically just um, a cathode and an anode immersed in an electrolytic solution. Um, you can either apply a constant current or a constant potential. Um, so the cathode is always held at a negative potential relative to the, the anode. Um, <coughs> so the oxide will always form, well, yeah, in this case, sorry, the cathode can either be a silicon wafer or um, any sort of metal like platinum, provided it doesn't corrode in the electrolytic solution. Um, but the anode uh, must be silicon wafer because that's the that's the working electrode. That's the electrode that grows the oxide. So hence the term anodic oxidation. Um, so why investigate anodic oxidations? Well, thermal silicon dioxide has been um, the predominant dielectric film for decades. It you know it passivates the fused and underfused silicon wafers, and it provides good masking against dopants and chemical etching, but it's, it's too expensive and it's thermally intensive. So what, what can we do? What, what, can we grow a film or can we create a silicon dioxide that has the same properties as, as thermal silicon dioxide, but it's grown at a much lower temperature? So anodic oxidation sort of fits this. So they, they can be grown at room temperature. They don't degrade the silicon bulk lifetime because they're processed at low temperature. Um, yeah, the low temperatures minim minimise energy consumption and therefore could potentially reduce the cost and they don't require any complex um, chemical vapour depositions. <coughs> so let's uh, first look at the electrochemical cell design. So this is just, uh, I'll present a couple of them, but um, this is a typical O-ring cell. So in this case only one side, is in, one side of the silicon wafer is in contact with the ele electrolyte, um, so therefore the oxide will go only on one side. Um, to create a uniform oxide, um, the silicon wafer sits on a, a, a sheet of platinum, um, and the sheet of platinum is held at a positive voltage relative to the um, platinum mesh held in the uh, electrolyte. Um, I guess the disadvantage of this sort of cell is that the whole area, it's, it'll be difficult to oxidise the, the full surface area of the wafer because you have that O-ring seal. Um, so we have one of these at the ANU that I haven't used yet, but it only sort of, the oxidation area is about 60% of the total surface area. So it's not something I'd probably look at too much. Um, another way is not to use metal at all. Use two different electrolytes that contact the silicon wafer, which is, uh, so which is here in the middle, that's a silicon wafer. So you can, instead of making metal contact to this side, you use an acid, or some sort of another electrolyte, possibly not hydrophobic. HF because it will create porous silicon, but um, then you grow, the oxide will grow on side B, 
Um, the advantage of this is there's no metal contact, so it limits contamination in a way, but it's quite complex and yeah, something else, we'll look at something else. Um, this is the most simplest design and this is the design I've employed over the last couple of years just because um, it's easy to alter, easy to fix. Um, I guess it's, it's not entirely practical because the full wafer isn't being immersed, but um, it, as I said, it's just it's very easy. Um, you know, contact's made to the top of the silicon and it's just dunked in um, the electrolyte. Um, you have your cathode, you have your anode, and the oxide will grow on both sides of the wafer. So this is the cell that I'll be using um, and presenting today. Um, so this is the basic setup. Um, so here we have our two electrodes, and this I've chosen to use two silicon wafers. Um, as I said, the cathode can be anything, but it's just it was just convenient to use a silicon wafer because we have you know if it breaks, we have thousands of other wafers that I could use. Um, the electrolyte is nitric acid. Um, it's the only reason that was chosen because it's it's a common chemical and it's reasonably conductive, which is what you need. And the contacts were just aluminium coated alligator clips. And the reason why I use aluminium is because it doesn't corrode in nitric acid. Okay, so the next step is to choose whether you want to use constant current or constant potential. So a lot of people who do anodic oxidations choose to use a constant current. But it a little more complicated because you need to keep increasing the voltage to maintain that constant current and in that case you can start to exceed quite high voltages. So I didn't really want to do that so I opted for the constant voltage and low voltage too, 30 volts and in this case as the oxide grows the current decreases with time. So we've gone for the constant potential. So in summary with the cell design we've just gone with an immersion cell. This is very simple. Um, the electrodes were both silicon wafers because it's convenient. Contacts were just very simple, just aluminium contacts at the top of the wafer. And electrolyte and nitric acid. And we've chosen the constant potential just because it's a bit safer. Okay, so let's look at um, the direct current and nodding oxidation method. Okay, so in this procedure, um, all they do is you just dunk the wafers in nitric acid contact them and then apply a 30 volt bias across the, um, the sample. So the sample held at the high potential, the anode, will grow the oxide. Um, in this case, the oxidation was for three hours. There's no particular reason. I haven't optimised it yet. It was just something I went with as a first go just because I thought longer times would give, it, give a better result, but I haven't really tried, tested it yet. Um, so the nitric acid is held at room temperature and these are 5 ohm centimetre anti wafers. So if we um, look at um, the oxide, oxide thickness as a function of nitric acid concentration, we see that um, for low nitric acid concentrations, you grow an oxide that's reasonably thick, 55 nanometers, and use, as you increase the concentration up to 70%, um, the thickness you know, is less than 20 nanometers. So uh, there's a sort of quite a strong trend here. And, um, it sort of indicates that water is the primary um, oxidation source for growing these oxide films. So if we look back at um, some theory, they say the same thing. It doesn't matter what your electrolyte is, water is the primary source of, um, for the anodic oxidation process. And this is the reason, so this is the main reaction that occurs at the anode. And it requires a hole or holes to complete this reaction to form silicon dioxide. There should be a silicon dioxide there, whoops. Um, <coughs> but um, the solvent, so nitric acid in this case, so, so, so water you know, is the main uh, oxidation source, but um, the nitric acid can also con contribute to the oxidation. So we see that as you go to higher concentrations, the oxide thickness decreases, and this is because the oxidation efficiency is reduced. And the main reason that occurs is because the nitric acid has to be decomposed um, into water before it can then, this water that's um, being produced or being produced from this nitric acid is then used in reaction one to create, um, to um, grow the oxide. So that becomes quite inefficient. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, so you see uh, uh, that strong trend um, with um, thickness against uh, nitric acid concentration is primarily due to the fact that the oxidation efficiency reduces. 
Um, that's because water has to be produced by this um, reaction before it can be um, created an oxide through this reaction. So how do these, how does this water sort of migrate, how do these anions migrate through the silicon dioxide film? Um, there's several different reactions and, and, and theories, but um, I guess the main, two main things I sort of came across is that, you know, water has a sort of a dipole moment. So when you apply this potential across these electrodes, the water tends to <coughs> um, drift to the anode and in doing that it creates an oxide. So that's one way. And then another way is that, <coughs> again, the water drifts into the sil silicon dioxide and then dissociates into molecular oxygen and hydroxide. Then they can also form an oxide. Um, whether nitrate from the decomposition of nitric acid can also contribute to growing the oxide, it's, it's unknown, but um, it may be involved somewhere. Um, so <coughs> when you, um, the reason why it's a whole different process is because when you um, immerse um, silicon wafers in electrolyte like nitric acid and you apply a positive potential, you, in intype you create a depletion case or inversion. So you're accumulating holes, you're driving holes to the interface. So in this case for n-type, because it's in depletion, um, the reaction is going to be limited by the supply of holes to the interface. But if you can, if you illuminate the silicon wafer, you can greatly increase the number of holes that um, um, are supplied to the interface and then you can increase the, um, the oxidation rate. So n-type is very sensitive to illumination. <coughs> but for p-type, um, again, when you apply a positive potential, you're in accumulation. So, <coughs> and because holes are the majority carry, there's a, a large supply of holes to the interface, and uh, the oxidation in this case is is uh, not influenced by illumination whatsoever. So, if you if you grew the oxide in the dark or under illumination, you would have the same oxidation rate. <coughs> so, if we look now, if we look at the um, current profiles as a function of oxidation time, um, we see that. Uh, the thicker oxides um, grown in 20% nitric acid, the current seems to remain stable for a long period of time. And this could be or is likely related to the water concentration because there's a continuous supply of water to the interface. But in the case of um, when you grow the oxide in 70% nitric acid, it, um, it starts to fall off um, quite early. And this is, you know, um, indicative of a, a thickening oxide. Um, but yeah, and, and the re reduction as the oxide grows thicker is possibly related to the supply of water to the interface. Um, so if we look at the impact of the electrode spacing, um, this is a bit of an unknown. I've tried to find out why this is. So if you have the electrodes quite close together, um, so the oxide will grow on both sides of the wafer on the anode. But if you have the electrodes quite uh, space you know, close together, then the oxide will grow all the oxide growth is actually inhibited on the side facing the electrode, whereas on the other side, the oxide tends to grow much thicker. And when you uh, increase that spacing, then the oxide facing the cathode actually starts to grow thicker also. So it's not really known why that occurs. Um, it's, it's been noted in a, in a book, it said this, you know, the spacing does have an impact on the oxide thickness, but no explanation was given. So I can't really explain why that is. So the best thing to do is just keep them far apart so then the oxide grows uniform on both sides. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, surface passivation. <coughs> so, um, so what we've done is we've grown the oxide um, for three hours and then what we're doing now is we're only annealing at 400 degrees. We only want to look at annealing at 400 degrees. So with no anneal, the surface recombination is very high. If you do an oxygen anneal, it improves, but still very high. Um, a 30 minute forming gas drops it down to a suitable level, but the, old, uh, the best sequence, I guess, here is um, the oxygen forming gas combination. So O2 for 30 minutes and then forming gas for uh, 30 minutes. And this provides a, a, a reasonably low surface recombination. In this case, about uh, 30 centimetres a second, um, which, is, which is pretty good. Um, so, okay, so now let's look at so here we're 
we've, so we've chosen the best um, annealing sequence. Now we're going to look at um, the passivation versus the um, nitric acid concentration. Um, so when we grow it in water, uh, yeah, the, um, the surface recombination is quite high, but as you grow the oxide in um, high concentrated nitric acid, the surface recombination keeps dropping. So the thickness of this one would be about 50 nanometers and the thickness of this oxide would be about 20. So even though, <coughs> um, uh, you know, water, the oxidation efficiency is quite low, there's obviously something else happening that's creating uh, a better surface or high surface passivation in this case. Um, so on the right, we plot the surface recombination and it continues to decrease. There's a, a, a monotonic trend. So then if we do some modelling, um, so all we've done here is um, we've maintained a constant interface defect density and all we're doing, and, and constant capture cross-sections, and all we're doing is just changing the charge, just adding charge. And we see we get quite good fits, so all we're doing is by increasing the charge in the modelling, we see that we get quite good fits. So this is a good indication that the reason why the um, passivation decreases with increasing nitric acid concentration is primarily due to a high fixed charge in the film. Um, just to sort of confirm that, give us a bit more confidence, we've done some CV2. Um, so when you do the analysis, we see that um, in fact yeah, the charge in the, in the oxide grown in 20% nitric acid which had a high surface recombination, um, has, a, uh, has a lower charge, whereas the film grown in um, centimetre-cent nitric acid, which had the lowest surface recombination, has a higher charge. And so the, that reason sort of confirms the modelling too. So a higher charge in the um, oxide grown in centimetre-cent nitric acid. And if we plot the DR2, they're basically they're very similar. So it looks like the primary reason for those differences in surface recombination is, is due to the charge in the film. Okay, so look at the summary of this section. So the silicon dioxide thickness um, decreases with increasing nitric acid concentration. Um, the thickness is controlled by the water concentration and um, uh, the anodic oxidation is a hole driven process. So illumination will greatly affect the oxidation rate on n-type silicon but won't on p-type silicon. Um, annealing and oxygen forming gas um, at 400 degrees provides the best surface passivation and our lowest S are achieved when the oxides are um, um, carried out in 70% nitric acid and that's because these films contain a high positive charge. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, alternating current and other oxidations. Let's see if we can... So why investigate these AC oxidations? Um, so one case is to try and reduce the, that surface recombination as much as possible. Um, so how might this happen is that when you apply a, a, a periodic signal, you know, varying from plus and minus some voltage, um, you, 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 they, they, these anions are drifting back and forth across the growing oxide and, and doing so they take, they possibly take paths of you know, um, lower resistance, so leaky paths in your case. So in that case they have a much a high chance of actually passivating these defects in the oxide as they're moving back and forth. So let's see if um, actually... So again, we do the same thing. Oxida um, the oxidation's carried out for three hours. It hasn't been optimised. Um, it's done in nitric acid. And in this case, um, the only one electrode is just... It's just flipped from minus 30 to 30 volts. That's okay. So on the plus 30 volt, this, this um, electrode will start to oxidise, and when it's minus, this electrode will start to oxidise. So these are, are some of the cycle times that we investigated. So this is a DC case, um, and this is an AC case. So you start at minus, minus 30 volts for 25 seconds, and then plus 30 volts for 25 seconds. And then we've the lowest um, cycle times that we've done is 15 seconds. Oh, sorry, cycle times are 30 seconds. So half cycles are 15 seconds. We maintain that constant voltage of plus or minus 30 volts. So if we look at the current profiles, we see that the current is actually quite noisy um, in both cases initially for the first 20 minutes in this case. So it's, this is this could be due to the um, breakdown regrowth cycles of the oxide. So in this case, for oxidation times less than 20 minutes, it's unlikely that these oxides will provide you know, sufficient surface passivation. 
Um, but you see after 20 minutes the current starts to stabilise quite well and then um, in both cases it, it decreases, um, which is indicative of a, a thickening oxide. Um, but if we look at the surface recombination, um, with, um, so we looked at the cycle times we examined were 20, 30 and 50 seconds and we've uh, got a, um, an oxide grown by the DC process for a reference and we see that there's, there was, there's no real trend um, across these three different cycle times. So and in fact the surface recombination is a bit higher too. So um, it didn't really work the way it was planned but <coughs> um, I guess a lot more work probably needs to be done on this to really you know, make sure that you know, this can't actually improve the surface recombination. Maybe shorter uh, cycle times could improve the surface recombination, but in this case, the DC is still the best. Um, uh, this, this um, so for the DC oxidation, the cathode, this just shows you that the cathode, even though there is a bit of an oxide there, doesn't provide any passivation. Whereas for the AC process, both wafer one and two provide identical passivation. So I guess that's a benefit of doing the AC process. You're doing two wafers at once. Um, so if we try to examine why the AC um, is, um, has a higher surface ring combination compared to the DC, we've, we've tried to examine the uh, interface defect density and, and charge in the film, but I mean, it's a pretty big scatter and it's very hard to you take anything from this. The only thing we can really take from this is that all the films have a charge of around 2E12, which is quite high, and that's why they provide reasonably low surface recombination velocity. But the DRT is, you know, still quite high too, like 1E, 1, 2E12, so it's a bit too high. Um, so then if we plot, so these were, these were average values, but if we plot all the data that I measured and you plot it um, DRT versus QF, you kind of get this, you know, correlation happening, so where you have a, a lower DRT, you tend to have a lower charge and vice versa. So this could mean that, um, you know, when the oxide is growing, is forming quite well, you have less defects in the, in the oxide and I guess less defects at the, defects at the interface too. Um, but in doing that, um, I guess you're reducing your charge and you're re reducing the DRT, um, but you basically, you might not see any huge changes in surface recombination because that charge is dropping uh, too. Whereas in this case, the charge is quite high, even though the DIT is quite high. So this could be, this is a sort of another way of sort of examining whether your film is um, growing quite well or not. So ideally you want, this, this is the best case, having low DIT and low charge. Okay, so the summary of this section is that uh, AC oxidations can be done on both wafers simultaneously. Um, the current um, during the oxidation is unstable for um, oxidation times less than 20 minutes, but after 20 minutes it's, it starts to stabilise, so passivation, so yeah, your best, the passivation probably won't be um, good for times less than 20 minutes. Um, what have I got here? Uh, so we've examined three different cycle times, 20, 30 and 50 seconds, no real trend, but maybe shorter times need to be investigated. Um, there was no clear trend in why the AC oxides um, reach high S than those produced by the DC process. Um, but it is clear that all of these films have quite a high charge of 2E12, which is good for N-type. Okay, so now let's look at the, um, the impact of um, the nitric acid <coughs> purity on, on the surface passivation repeatability. So here's some oxides, um, here's, here's like a lot of experiments over, over a couple of year period. Um, so here on this axis is lifetime and here on this, on this axis is, is my mood. So, so you see here, it's, it's, you start off quite well, um, which was good and was encouraging, so you, you keep going. But, um, <coughs> Um, you get patches where the lifetime starts to dip and then all of a sudden you get a group that you know goes quite well and then a dip and then you get the best and then you get the worst straight after that and then this it was just it was very frustrating to um, to be in this period because it was hard to understand what was going on we tried many different things but um 
uh, one thing one thing we I did suspect in this was that maybe it was related to batches batches of nitric acid because all these high lifetimes were sort of grouped together. So then we decided to um, try a higher purity of nitric acid, and in doing so, we greatly improved the repeatability. So you see, with um, so the red the red and black is the AC um, oxidation, and so red is wafer one and black is wafer two. So you see for the first time that both wafer one and two are providing identical passivation, which has never happened before when the lifetime is quite high. And for the DC process, we're actually achieving probably the highest lifetime that we've achieved previously. I mean, I, I know there's only like uh, seven points here and like it could be related to this, but I did use, in the middle here, I did use some non-pure nitric acid and it dipped right down again. And as soon as I went back to the pure, it went back up. So the purity does have a big impact on the, the passivation that you achieve. So when you, when you think of pure nitric acid, you think immediately it's, it's very expensive, but um, it's really, uh, it's a bit more expensive, but it's not ridiculous. Um, so th this case was for growing oxides in 70% nitric acid, which give us the best service recombination. But if you look at um, oxides grown in 20% nitric acid, you actually see there's a larger difference in service passivation achieved when you use pure nitric acid. So there's a large variation, non-repeatable results when you're using um, low purity nitric acid. As soon as you go to pure nitric acid, it becomes quite consistent and the life, um, the, the passivation is quite good. Okay, so one one way to sort of work out whether your passivation is going to be quite good or, or bad is you can you can look at the currents. So in a case of you know when you're forming a good, well passivated oxide is that. <coughs> With increasing oxidation time, it should should decrease. This is sort of a normal trend, which is indicative of a thickening oxide. But for some reason, when you have oh, so this is so this, sorry, this is using pure nitric acid, and this is using non-pure nitric acid. So for some reason, at some point, the oxide starts to break down, and and it starts the current becomes quite high again. So it's unclear why this occurs, but whether there's defects incorporated in, in, in the oxide when it's growing and then yeah, it's really hard but maybe this is a way of saying all right if you if you measure this current then there's no point going any further to start again okay so <coughs> so the nitric acid purity has a big impact on the surface passivation repeatability um, in the case of 20 percent nitric acid it was quite clear that using a pure nitric acid solution does actually improve the passivation quite a lot um, and the current profiles might give you an indication of whether um, you, could, you, you achieve good or bad passivation. Okay, so, so we've looked at some good stuff and now probably the bad stuff, probably the worst stuff, so that'll kill these, uh, these, um, these uh, dielectric films. Um, so here's a set of um, samples. So the blue, is, uh, blue samples are grown by the DC oxidation method. Uh, and the green ones are the AC oxidation method. Um, so these samples were stored in air simultaneously at the same time, and you see they degrade quite fast. So this is normalised surface recombination, just so you can see them all together. Um, so yeah, after 10 days, it's getting bad, but after yeah, after a few months, it's it's really bad and it's unacceptable really. Um, um, and if you look at the sister wafer thermal silicon dioxide, they too degrade, but nowhere near as bad. But if you store samples in a desiccator, which is a humidity-free environment, so no basically very little water vapour, um, we start to see that the degradation is far less. It does degrade a little bit, but it's much, much less. So this is quite indicative that a primary source of degradation is, is, is water moisture. So we can, we can fix that problem by using some sort of capping layer that's impervious to water vapour or some other method. The only, the only issue is that it does still degrade even when it's in the desiccator. So um, it's expected that there's quite a lot of water in the film uh, when it's growing. So maybe, and if you, if you do a forming gas annual, then that, it, that water might um, dissociate, dissociate and you know, ionised hydrogen might actually find its way to the interface and break the silicon hydrogen bonds and that's why you get um, an increase in, in surface recombination. But, it's unclear. So there's still something happening even when it's in a humidity-free env environment. 
So to better understand what's actually happening in the film, um, so <coughs> these all these samples were just installed in air, and we've um, monitored the um, we've monitored the um, interface using capacitance voltage. We see that <coughs> as they degrade, we get these kinks in this in the CV curve, and um, that's very clear that as these films degrade, that the interface is, is, is degrading also. So the primary reason why this is dropping away is because the interface is being damaged. Why that is, it's, it's obviously due to water vapour, but where it's coming from, or well, obviously it's, a lot of it's coming from the, um, the air, but how much of the water in the film is contributing to this is, is unclear. Um, so possible solutions to prevent degradation are to use a capping film, it's impermeable to water vapour, like nitride. Um, or probably the most likely is to give it a short high temperature anneal to get rid of the water from the film um, and avoid doing a forming gas anneal. Um, but another option may be to prevent water from being absorbed from the, um, from the air is to actually do an owl anneal. Um, this could be, this is something I'm probably going to look at because this is a potentially a, re a restructure a potential, yeah, rear solar cell passivation structure. So you could have the oxide, a thick oxide, uh, then you cap it with aluminium, and then you do an al nil. You don't need to remove the aluminium because it'd be a contact as well. So an al nil is known to be um, the best way of introducing hydrogen to the interface. So there's a few ways of getting around it. Okay, so now for the last little bit. Uh, this is the stuff I've just been working on over the last couple of weeks, masking oxides. So when you have a diffusion and you immerse the samples in nitric acid again, you see the currents are much, much higher. Um, so for the p-type, I guess it's understandable, you just have a, a large a number of holes at the interface, but for, for n-type, it's, it, it's a bit strange, but um, uh, still trying to work out why the current is so much higher. Um, but they said they, from what I've read, it seems for n-type anyway that it could be a tunneling effect. So electrons tunneling into the to the silicon, but it's it's unclear at the moment. But it's yeah, it's quite clear that the currents are much much higher um, when in comparison to you know, an oxide, an undiffused silicon wafer. So and also what's interesting is that the oxides grow thicker much faster. Um, so you know after about 20 minutes on the p-type sample on the phosphorus diffuse sample. You already got around 150 nanometers, which is which is quite good. And for the um, boron diffuse, about 100 after 20 minutes, which is that's acceptable. It's quite good. Um, okay, so oh yeah, and if you leave it in for hours, there's not a so what's that 20 minutes to that's six hours, 20 minutes six hours, and you've grown what 50 nanometers in an additional five hours or so. So it really does slow down. Okay, so what we've done here is um, <coughs> this is this is a silicon wafer um, that's been what's this, boron diffused, and then we've grown the oxide. Um, it looks like it's passivating, but it's just the lifetimes here and here were identical. So I think the film's actually luminescing. It just looks like it's passivating. Um, the oxide thickness is about 100 nanometers. So what we've done here is we've just just as a test. So this could be the reason why we've used TMA and we've done it at 90 degrees for one hour is because it could be used for texturing too. So if it can protect a diffusion for a long period of time, it can protect one side from um, being textured also. So for the boron diffusion case, um, before and after is, is identical. And if you look at the average lifetimes, they're identical. So it's quite resistant, which is surprising um, and very interesting. So. In this case, so you can see here the diffusion's been etched. And the difference between here and here is about, so this etched about 50, 60 microns. So it's really resisting the TMA for the boron diffusion case. With the phosphorus diffusion, which is quite heavy, again, you can see where we grown the oxide. Um, so the average lifetime of this sample was about 530 microseconds. Um, <coughs> So we've done the same thing, placed it in TMA for <coughs> uh, at 80 to 90 degrees for one hour. Um, and unfortunately in this case, I mean it's resisted the TMA quite well, but there is some regions of etching, as you can see here and here. So it's 
resulted in a reduction in lifetime. I mean, it's not huge, but it is getting through. So there's still a bit more work to do there. Um, so if we look at the phosphorus diffusion case again, um, so this is the initial, and then we look at the, the lifetime of PLM gene, you know, every 12 minutes. So we see a slight drop in lifetime, but it's within the uncertainty of the actual measurement itself, so it doesn't look like there's much change after about 12 minutes. 24 minutes starts to drop off the lifetime, so there could be some itching over here, and then it continues to drop off a little bit. So it's dropped by about 100 microseconds in lifetime after about 40 minutes of etching in TMA. So it is re resisting quite well, but it is, there's some regions where it's not. But interesting, so when I removed this sample, rinsed it and stored it overnight and measured the lifetime again, and PL, the next day, um, it kept etching. So <laughs> obviously there was some TMA that sort of, it's working its way through the oxide film. And overnight it got into the, <coughs> got to the interface and started etching the fusion. So therefore, if, you're gonna, if we're gonna use these oxides as a, as a masking oxide, they have to be removed, removed straight away. Otherwise, you're gonna, the TMA incorporated in the film is just going to work its way to the interface and, and etch the diffusion. So the summary, so when a boron or phosphorus diffusion is present, the measured currents are much, much higher. Um, and this causes the oxide thickness to grow, or causes the oxide to grow much thicker, much faster. So you can get 100 nanometers within about 20 minutes, which is, which is excellent. It's probably faster than a wet ox, thermal wet ox. Um, phosphorus and boron diffusions can be protected quite well, but there's still a little bit of work to do. Um, I should mention that in the presence of HF, it just pff, doesn't matter how thick it is, um, it'll just it'll be removed in seconds. So, as an example, for a 100 nanometer oxide, if you had a thermal oxide, it would take minutes and 5% HF to etch away. Um, with these oxides, it's like a couple of seconds, no problems. So. Um, definitely not resistant to HF. Um, the boron diffuse sample um, looked quite good. It, the oxide protected the boron diffusion quite well. Um, yeah, that's right, yeah. If you, and I guess the, the important thing here too is even if they do both, even if this oxide does end up protecting them, protecting both boron and phosphorus diffusions, the films have to re be removed because there is obviously TMA working its way through the film. If you don't remove it, then it will end its, get, uh, end its way to the interface and etch the diffusion. Okay, so if we look at the collective summary. Um, so in this work, we used a, an immersion cell design only because it was simple. It was easy to do. Um, we chose a constant potential because it's, it's a bit safer. Again, it's simple. Um, nitric acid. It's, it's, it's a nice acid, it's, it's quite common, and it's, it's conductive. Um, <coughs> it was shown that there was a strong trend with, in oxide thickness as a function of nitric acid concentration. Um, and this was primarily due to the fact that water is the primary source um, for the anodic oxidation process. Um, we found that annealing these films in oxygen and forming gas at 400 degrees gave us the lowest surface recombination. Um, sorry, the lower surface recombination is achieved in a high concentration, and this is because, primarily because um, oxides formed in high concentrated nitric acid possess or contain a higher net positive charge than films grown in, say, a lower concentrated nitric, nitric acid solution. Um, <coughs> it was found that the AC method at this point in time doesn't improve the surface recombination. Um, which is a bit of a shame, but I think there's a lot more work to be done there. Um, I guess one of the big things I found is that the purity has a, has a big impact on the, on the consistency and the level of passivation. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, the films do degrade at this point in time, which is, which is really a killing point because it doesn't matter how well they'll passivate. If they degrade, then they're gonna be useless. So, this really needs to be fixed. Um, so that's something I'll be concentrating on in the next year or so. Um, so when a boron or phosphorus diffusion is present, 
the oxidation rate is much, much faster, as I said before, and you can grow thicker oxide, which is quite encouraging. Um, and it's and they're quite resistant. These film, these oxide, thick oxide films are quite resistant to long etches in TMHing. So it's, it could be used in texturing and, and protecting the diffusions. Um, but um, as I said before, yeah, the oxide must be removed after the uh, long etching in TMA. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions, so. Uh, shoot. I'm just wondering how you measured your interface state density. Um, so I just did it with uh, capacitance voltage, and then so I had to use a term and method. So it's a little, it's um, I'm not familiar. Are you familiar with the term? Yeah. So it's not as accurate as using. So ideally, you'd use you'd you'd measure a low frequency curve and a high frequency curve, and then from those measured. Um, curves you could extract a DRT. That's the most accurate way of doing it. I had to do the termin because I could only get high frequency measurements. Because when you do low frequency measurements, the film's just way too leaky and you can't get anything at all. So yeah, they could the values, the absolute values, could be a little bit off. But I'm pretty confident about the charge anyway. So yeah. Any questions? Uh, and how did you measure the thickness of the outside? Um, so in the first case, it was you, I used lipsometry. Um, so those error bars represented 20% 20, 20 error because the the samples were chemically polished, not mechanically polished. So, but um, so yeah, lipsometry, single wavelength lipsometry. So. And uh, have you compared the different oxidizer solutions that that uh, uh, sulfuric acid? No, I haven't. Haven't. I mean, there's a million. There's a lot of. If you sit down and look at it, there's a lot of different directions to go. And I guess I just just set nitric acid as one variable, or not a variable, and just said that's what I'm going to use, and and nothing. Else. And it's sort of been. There is. Um, Previous experiments that have shown that nitric acid, you know, passivates quite well in terms of um, the moss structures and things like that. So, um, so, so, why do you think you get higher charges, strong charges, with the higher concentrations? Of yeah, that's a good question. I, I really don't know. And maybe the um, the nitrites playing a bigger part in. In, in forming those positive charges, so so water, yeah, so at low concentration looks like water is the dominant um, uh, water. The water doesn't have to be um, broken down from the nitric acid to then oxidise the surface; it just comes directly from the DI. But at yeah, high concentrations, nitric acid has to be broken down. So maybe it's related to something with that, but I really, I really don't know. But, but nitric acid is a very strong oxidising agent, so... I think, um, yeah, but there has been some experiments, especially with nitrate, NO3, um, that it wasn't actually the primary source of oxygen. So it doesn't matter how concentrated the nitric acid is, it'll always break that nitric acid down and, and, and produce water and then oxidise. That's what they say anyway. So maybe it's related to something to do with that. And um, one other question: So, do you have so do you have any theories about why the oxides degrade? Um, maybe I shouldn't have done a formic acid now. <laughs> so maybe if I did a nitrogen now instead, that would tell me whether it's a hydrogen. So the silicon-hydrogen bond. Yeah. But yeah. I suppose if you show that by just not doing a formic acid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This was so back in the days of Dion Grove when they were doing thermal oxidation. They saw the, the oxide layer grew to sort of parabolic in a square of time due to the diffusion of oxygen through the film. You know, it took longer to diffuse to a film that was thickening. Yeah. Did you do any of the kinetics here? I'm mean, just wondering. And, and, and so this was, is what Dion Grove showed or, or hypothesized that this reaction was occurring. You know, whatever reactant species was going, going diffusing to the film, then reacting at the silicon SiO2 interface. Did you look when you? When you were doing these constant voltage experiments at the, the kinetics of the increase of the oxidation layer? Ah, uh, no. I, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's something, I guess it's another next step. I was just purely interested in the passivation, whether it could passivate, and then everything yeah, well, would follow from there. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty amazing.
Um, you were doing that at 30 volts. Would you expect the same thing to happen like at 60 but faster? Or? So actually what I didn't put in is I have gone to higher voltages and it makes basically no difference to the current. So it's really limited the reaction that's occurring. Um, it wasn't, I, was, I tested the contacts too and it wasn't related to that, it was just purely related to the oxidation reaction. So high voltages didn't really do anything like the 60 volts. Maybe if I went to like 100 and 150 volts it might have jumped up. So it was the exact same rate, same, same current? Yeah. Very similar. Might have been like a little kick up but nothing significant. So there's no difference between AC and DC at higher voltages? Uh, if I went to a higher voltage in AC, yeah. I've never tried. I haven't tried that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. No. Uh, in regard to the annealing process, do you have a comment? Why do you have? Why do you need to have that oxygen anneal process there? And okay. did you op optimize the, the, the duration <coughs> of the annealing? Um, so. The, oxid, the oxygen, uh, the oxidation, I guess, was necessary. It seemed like, from our point of view, that it sort of helped complete the oxidation process in a way. Um, so, if you did like a forming gas for an hour, the passivation wasn't quite at the same level as if you did an oxidation, oxygen anneal, and then a forming gas anneal. So, the oxygen was obviously doing something to the film. Not quite sure what, but it was. There was a clear trend that. Oxygen then from the gas was the best. But oxygen has to, um, the new oxygen new has to come before the forming yep. gas. Yeah, so if you were to do, it would be the same with anything, right? So if you did a forming gas before anything else, you just, you just mitigate the, um, the, the forming gas anneal because the hydrogen would just be removed again. So we did do that, we did the other way around it. It was bad. So. Like, sorry, um, regarding the oxidation done on diffused wafers, yeah. um, do you do it in AC or DC? Is this is just, yeah, DC. Just DC. I did try AC like yesterday. <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> no, didn't. Um, so, did you try different doping profiles? No, not yet. No. So, it's, uh, just 30, micro, uh, 30 ohms? Yeah, it was just what I had at the time. I had like 30 ohms per square and I. Uh, got some wafers from somebody else and they had 100 ohms per square. So yeah, there's a lot more work to do there. And I mean, if you could vary, the idea or well, the next few weeks, I guess, is to get wafers with, you know, say for phosphorus, get different dope, um, different sheet resistance, so different surface concentrations, and then plot, set a time of say 20 minutes and look at the thickness as a function of that and might give us a bit more indication of why they grow thicker. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the masking properties are quite important too. Let's double side diffuse the way right? Sorry? Double side diffuse the way. Yeah, 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 they'll double diffuse, yeah. Double side diffuse. I have a question. Yep. Um, have you looked at the actual uh, structure of this oxide, maybe in a TEM or SEM? Have you also characterized it optically with uh, maybe multi wavelength ellipsometry to actually find out whether it's porous or whether yeah. the index of refraction is what you expect. How yeah. much do you know about this oxide? Yeah, it's about the oxide property or the chemical structure of the oxide, I don't really know that much. As I said before, like um, I've been primarily focused on the passivation side of things, so it's taken a lot of it's taken a lot of time. Um, so I haven't been able to look at yeah, the actual structure of the oxide. And at this point in time. Uh, uh, multi wavelength ellipsometry, you haven't done either? No, this? no, not okay. at all. So that might be interesting. But um, yeah, there's a couple of things I can look at. Definitely. Sorry, there's something I'm co confused about. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that oxidation is better on uh, P type samples, I mean, without light, without illumination, right? But uh, when you do it on diffuse samples, Oxidation seems to be much faster, faster on phosphorus diffuse samples. It seems to be a contradiction. Yeah, exactly. So I thought I really, that's what I said, I've only looked at this the last few weeks and there is a, yeah, it's, it's, it's unclear. I've tried to look through the literature or why that might be and again, there's very little information. One method, they, it could be just two different reactions occurring, so I really don't know about that. It was just, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Are there any other questions? Um, I noticed that uh, the, all your passivation curves with injection level are on N-type. Do you have any with P-type? <laughs> I just, um, 
as I said before, like with the nitric acid, um, I just I picked nitric acid and I wasn't going to change it. And the same with the, the silicon wafer, I had N-type and I was just sticking with that. Um, I had a lot of it too, so I didn't want to, you know, go halfway through an experiment and have to change to like a P-type wafer because then it just, you just learn nothing from that. So this is the best way of learning something. So I don't know what would happen on P-type. If it is positive charge in the film, then it would definitely be worse. Question. Yeah, this, well, let's thank uh, Nick again for this wonderful presentation.